pray these things in Jesus name. Amen. Hebrews chapter 4 and we'll begin reading in verse 14 and read on down to verse 16 the end of the chapter. The Bible says seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens Jesus the Son of God let us hold fast our profession for we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly under the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Henry Dempsey was piloting a commuter, commuter flight from Portland, Maine to Boston and he was almost to his destination when he heard an unusual sound coming from the rear of the airplane and so he turned the controls over to his co-pilot and he went to the back of the plane to check it out and as he approached the tail section of the airplane it hit a an air pocket and if you've been up in a in an airplane that hits an air pocket that can really cause a jolt and it did and mr dempsey was tossed onto the back door of the aircraft where he realized what the unusual sound was the back door was not latched correctly and when his weight slammed against it it opened and Henry Dempsey was sucked out the back of the aircraft. Meanwhile, in the cockpit, the, the co-pilot saw the indicator light. He heard the commotion, and he realized that the rear door was open, so he radioed the nearest airport and requested permission to make a, an emergency landing. He also requested that a helicopter be sent out. They were over a, a part of the ocean there. He, re he requested a helicopter be sent out to search for the pilot. When the co-pilot landed the aircraft, they found Henry Dempsey. See, there was a ladder on the outside of the airplane, and he had caught hold of that ladder when he was sucked out. And somehow, he held on for 10 minutes as the airplane threw, flew over 200 miles per hour at an elevation altitude of 4,000 feet, and then landing he was 12 inches off of the runway at landing and somehow kept his head and body from hitting the tarmac. And then it took airport personnel several minutes to pry his fingers off of that ladder. Now, during those 10 minutes of frightful flight, I bet that Mr. Dempsey did not lack motivation to hang on to that ladder, right? On a scale of 1 to 10, you know, you like when the doctor asks you pain scale, 1 to 10. Like, it's always 10 for me, all right? But uh, anyway, on a scale of 1 to 10, what do you suppose was his motivation level to cling to that ladder? Probably 11 or 12, right? On the same scale, what should be our level of motivation to cling to Christ? It, it ought to be off the chart, right? Well, what we just read, and this book of Hebrews that is addressed to Hebrew Christians, the, the original audience, the Hebrew Christians to whom the letter was originally written, they had made a public profession of Christ, of, of faith in Christ. They believed in Jesus as their Messiah. And in doing so, they left Judaism. They left their old religion and joined themselves to the Christian church. Uh, most of them, I believe the majority of the audience that would originally read or hear read this, this letter, they were truly born again. They were saved. Some of them had heard the gospel, heard about Jesus, and uh, maybe they even believed he was the Messiah, but they had not yet put their faith and trust in Christ as their Savior. And, and then... Uh, pressure is building on them to forsake that profession of faith that they had made. But, but all of them are given this command that we read. Cling to Christ. Don't loosen your grip. Don't let go. Not only did God command, and we see that in uh, verse 14, let us hold fast our profession. But not only did God command a first century Jewish church to cling to Christ, 
But he put that command on the pages of Holy Scripture. And then God preserved that Scripture for 2,000 years so that down through the ages, the church has had it and now we hold it in our hands. Why? Well, because God designs to give us the same commandment. We are commanded to cling to Christ. That's, that's a direct order from heaven to here to us. Hebrews 4.14, seeing then that you're, we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. The word profession translates the word homologia, and that literally means to say the same and so to agree in one's statement. The idea here is that of a believer agreeing with God as to the report that he gives in the Bible of his Son, that Jesus is our Christ, our Lord, our Messiah, that Jesus died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried and that the third day he rose again according to the Scriptures. Why? For our sins, so that all who would place their faith and trust in Christ would have their sins forgiven and receive the free gift of salvation. That's the believer's profession, or that's the believer's confession. All true Christians say the same thing when it comes to their experience of salvation. The Hebrew Christians had confessed Jesus as their Messiah and confessed Him as their high priest. And so they are commanded, or they were commanded, to hold fast to that profession. Hold fast means to take a tight grip, hold on to it, white knuckle it. Sometimes we use that term, right? Every Christian has made a profession of faith in Christ. We publicly proclaim Jesus as our Savior and Lord. I remember the night that I repented and believing in Jesus, I asked Him to save me from my sins, to be my Savior. Is in a Bible college dorm room. I knelt beside the bed and there received the free gift of salvation. And I looked up after praying and the alarm clock read 11.43 p.m. It was September 26, 1999. Jesus saved me and I placed my faith in Him completely. As the Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. There, believing in Christ, I called upon Him. Do you know what I did after that? I became a secret Christian. No, no. I made public my profession of faith the following week in believer's baptism. And that was hard to do because I grew up in a preacher's home and I figured everybody knew I was a Christian, right? But I wasn't. And so that was a little bit, it wasn't near as difficult for me as it was for some of these Hebrew Christians. But it, it was a little bit of a, a little bit of an issue. But not every Christian can describe their confession of faith in exactly the same terms as I describe mine. Some people don't remember the exact date. Some of you when, you, when you trusted Christ, there wasn't a clock right there for you to look at and kind of burn itself into your mind. And I remember that because I wrote it down later so I would not forget. Other people may not talk about the place. That might not be important, the place you're at. But every Christian can say the same thing in this respect. We all say that Jesus Christ, God's Son, saved us from our sins. He is our Lord. That's our homologia. That's our profession. The commandment to cling to our profession in Christ is repeated over and over again throughout this epistle. In chapter 2, verse 1, chapter 3, verse 6, chapter 3, verse 14, what we just read, 4, 14, chapter 6, verse 11, chapter 10, verses 23 through 25, in verse 35, chapter 12, chapter 13, it's repeated all the way through this epistle. The early Hebrew Christians had to be commanded this way. We must be commanded this way. Now, you cannot, if you're saved, you cannot lose your salvation. Right? You're, we're not hanging out the back of an airplane and if we let go, we're going we're gonna to go to hell. That's, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about clinging to our profession of faith. Our confession of faith. Right? Well, why must we be commanded this way? Well, we are commanded this way because we're so often tempted to loosen our grip. 
We're, we're tempted to, to, to loosen our grip and maybe let up a little bit on that profession of faith. Here we see in our text verse, verse 14, seeing then we have a high priest passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God. Let us hold fast our profession. Cling to your profession in Christ. Such a clear command, let us hold fast our profession. Such a command carries with it a, a, a real implication. The implication is that the command is necessary because there's a possibility, a danger, that we might stop doing it. Otherwise, there's no need for a command, right? Um, you don't have to command me to breathe. I'm going to do it, right? It's no, the, only, the only possibility is if, if I were to die. But, um, and so there's a danger we might not do it. Why not? Well, if you look at the end of that verse, or the end of verse 16, verse 16 says, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help. And look at this last term, in time of need. In time of need means at the opportune, the critical time. In other words, at the crucial moment, this time element in our text emphasizes the fact that there are critical times when temptations and trials will attack you, will attack me in our Christian lives and try to get us to loosen our grip on our profession in Christ. The early Hebrew Christians were severely tempted to let go of their profession in Christ. That was for them their time of need, the critical moment. They were persecuted for their faith in Christ. They were sorely tempted to return to the religion of their fathers. After all, any Jew could... could um, travel to Jerusalem and see uh, that magnificent temple. And, and they could see something that was tangible and, and visible and concrete as they watched the priests perform sacrifices, offer incense, wear all their crazy uh, holy looking garb and see the gold and the sparkling and the big and the masses of people assembled. And, and uh, when a person is going through persecution or going through trial as these Hebrew Christians were, it's so much easier to walk by sight than it is to walk by faith. You ever notice when you get in, how many of you ever been to a big church and there's just like a thousand or two thousand people or maybe some big gathering? You ever notice that it's a whole lot easier to get into the spirit of worship at that point in time? <laughs> like you got a thousand people singing strongly and man, it just, it just kind of gives you a good feeling. You're, you're just into it. You, you know, that that's wonderful. I'm not saying that that's a bad thing, but Part of that is walking by faith. Oh, it must be real because there's more people involved in this with me. Right? Well, and, and, and uh, that's partly by design. God, God created the church as a community and we encourage one another that way. But uh, part of that is just seeing first to believe. And that's what the temptation was for these Hebrew Christians. Their church was small compared to that temple. Their, their, their fellowship of believers was, was uh, pretty feeble looking compared to the masses that would gather on the feast days in Jerusalem, even at the local synagogue. And so it was easier to walk by sight than by faith. That's why the command was given to them. Why is the command given to us? We are tempted to loosen our grip on our profession in Christ. What tempts us that way? Well, trials do. Trials tempt us. We are put to the test by trials in this life and find ourselves in the crucible of temptation. What trials tempt us? And for us, there is this time of need, this opportune moment, this, this crucial time finds each and every one of us there's the trial of pain, physical pain. When, you see, when you're tempted to say, you know what, sickness, chronic illness, uh, maybe, maybe pain of someone else, we're tempted to say, Jesus isn't good to me. I've prayed about this. I haven't got the answer I wanted. 
we're tempted to say God is just not being good to me we loosen that grip a little bit there's there's the trial of emotional pain you know some other Christian has disappointed me oh if if Christ is so good then why does he allow this to happen there's the trial of pleasure Demas forsook Paul and Paul writes Demas hath forsaken me having done what having loved this present world and I think maybe in America this is the trial we must endure the most the trial of pleasure no people in the history of the world have had as much pleasure at their fingertips as we do we have a comfortable life I I, I, I get I get to uh, complaining more than I should when it rains so much in the backyard is a swamp right I mean it's just if I walk out there you're not supposed to sink in the grass up to your knees in mud right <laughs> and I get to complain but you know what there are places in the world where man they take that all day every day and on twice on Sunday right I remember when we were in Bolivia and we were driving past the city dump in Cochabamba city of two million and there were people living in the dump there's nobody living in the landfills that I know of around here, right? We have it good. Demas forsook Paul having a love for this present world. Judas Iscariot betrayed Jesus for money. Even so, many Christians or pseudo-Christians today deny the teachings of Christ and the Bible in order to follow after pleasure in order to follow after sin the trial of pleasure is indeed a time of need for all of us there's the trial also of people christians are often silent about christ in public because they they don't want to lose the approval of some other person or some other group of people or they compromise their faith in order to uh, avoid offending unbelievers and the trial of people and the trial of pleasure are often tied together. But the book of Proverbs says the fear of man brings a snare. That is why we must be commanded by God to hold fast to our profession. How do we cling to Christ? Say we see the command. Here's what. Now how? Especially in times of great temptation. Sitting in a seat in church on Sunday morning sometimes you can feel like well I'm just I, I've got it together now I'm, I'm going to cling to Christ because we're sitting in agreement together but then we're going to get separated throughout the week and the trials come to each of us many times individually how do we cling to Christ in those times what's the key to faithfulness in Christ it is this prayer we must cling to Christ in prayer now that when we're saved God keeps us saved by his power but on the human side of things the key to our remaining faithful to the Lord is prayer it is by prayer that we lay hold upon Christ and through prayer that that we receive God's strength to remain faithful in verse 16 it says, let us therefore come boldly under the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. For the unbeliever, God's throne is a throne of judgment. But for us who have Christ as our Savior, God's throne is a throne of grace. And because of that, we are given this second commandment. There are two commandments in this passage. In the second one, is this let us come boldly under the throne of grace that phrase describes prayer we approach God's throne in prayer it says here let's come boldly boldly means that in prayer we draw near to God's throne with great confidence how do we get this confidence well Christ to whom we cling is mentioned here and described here as our great high priest he is our representative and advocate at the throne of grace and we cling to Christ in prayer this is key to perseverance 
Someone has said that all Christians struggle with two crucial areas that will make or break us in the Christian life. One is perseverance in times of trial, and the second is prayer. And as you know, they are connected. A vital prayer life is essential to enduring trials. And as you can see, that these two cru crucial areas are highlighted by the two commandments in our text. Let us hold fast our profession, verse 14. Verse 16, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. In, and these two commands are inextricably linked. In times of great temptation, we must cling to Christ in prayer. That's the key. Now, how does that work? Okay, you say, all right, I'm going to make a list. I'm going to... I'm going to schedule a time. I'm going to go to Christ in prayer. But, but, but really, how does that work? What are the nuts and bolts of prayer giving me the strength to endure trials? How does that work? In prayer, Christ gives you the help of mercy. We boldly approach the throne of grace. Prayer avails us to God's timely help. In, in the crucial time, we need God's mercy in a time of trial. At the throne of grace, we receive it in prayer. If you look at verse 16, let's therefore come boldly under the throne of grace. There's prayer. What happens there? That we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. I want you to notice that that word help. And help translates a word called baathia. And that word refers especially uh, it refers to especially critical assistance that that uh, meets an urgent need in a specific situation. Baathia was also a nautical term used by sailors in the ancient Greek world. And it's used in the Bible, too, in Acts chapter 27, uh, when the Apostle Paul is being transported from his arrest in Jerusalem to Rome. And he's on a ship, and, and a sudden storm overtakes that ship, and they are afraid that it's going to be broken apart by the waves. In Acts chapter 27, the sailors use, and the term is they use helps, to strengthen the ship, that term translated helps in Acts 27 is Baathia. And, and it says, um, here's what it says, when they had taken up, Acts 27, 17, when they had taken up, they used helps undergirding the ship and fearing lest they should fall into the quicksand, strike sail, and so were driven. And so in the midst of, of the storm, sailors would pass ropes underneath of the hull of the ship and and then winch them tight and and basically um, thus supported the ship would be better able to withstand the severe pounding of the waves and the wind and just the stress of that storm. Well, from time to time in life, we all encounter an unexpected storm of a trial or a temptation. And that's when we cling, we must cling to Christ in prayer. For in prayer, he gives us this help, this undergirding that holds the whole of our ship together in the storm. This help keeps us from being battered into pieces by the waves in prayer at the throne of grace. Christ gives us the help of mercy. Now, what is mercy and how does it help us? Mercy refers to compassion, to pity. Mercy is God's compassion and pity towards us. Now we need to distinguish between grace and mercy. Sometimes people get those confused. Grace is God's solution to man's sin. Mercy is God's solution to man's misery. Grace covers sin while mercy removes the pain. Grace forgives while mercy restores. Grace gives us what we do not deserve while mercy withholds what we do deserve. In prayer, we find mercy. That means we receive infinite compassion from God as we approach the throne of grace. During my sophomore year of college, my Greek professor, his name was Keith Kaiser, and he was a bulldog of a man. He actually looked like a bulldog. I mean, he was... 
He was a guy that you didn't want to mess with. He had a stern manner and it was legendary on campus. I have literally witnessed Keith Kaiser make a grown man cry in front of 200 students. <laughs> in time, I was taking Greek from him. In time, I began to struggle with my Greek assignments and I received some of his stern treatment. <laughs> on one Saturday, I was, I was uh, sitting there watching the college soccer team play a home game and here comes Dr. Kaiser. <laughs> And he sits down next to me on the bleacher and he, he says, I want to talk to you about Greek. And I thought, man, it's Saturday. I've had enough for one week. And as I prepared to have my face peeled off, Dr. Kaiser put his hand around, his, around my shoulders and asked, how can I help you? What causes you to struggle? What can I do to get you back on track? You know what, my entire conception of Dr. Kaiser changed that day because the bulldog became a teddy bear. <laughs> By the way, I passed Greek. You know, sometimes when you do something wrong, you need stern correction. That's, that's never out of the question. But at other times, stern correction might crush you. And it's at those times that you need most of all, compassion, mercy, God's understanding, God's pity, God's entering into suffering with us. And Jesus Christ knows the difference between one situation and the other. How does he know? We say, well, he's God. Well, that sounds kind of cold, doesn't it? I mean, here's God and yeah, he knows everything and, and uh, he can just deal with us. But that's really not how Christ knows. If you look in verse 14, seeing then we have a great high priest that has passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. So there he is on the, on the right hand of God's throne all the time for us. He says, because we have him there, let us hold fast our profession. But look at verse 15. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. I want you to notice in verse 14 the title given to our great high priest. It says that it is Jesus, the Son of God. That is very descriptive. The term Son of God emphasizes the fact that He is divine. He is God, the God in flesh, God incarnate, the second person of the Trinity, and He is divine. But the term Jesus is a human name. That, that, that it, it, it expresses his humanity. And Jesus became man without ceasing to be God. And because of his humanity, Jesus absolutely can sympathize with us over our weaknesses. He is touched with the feelings of our infirmities. In other words, he feels what you feel. You know that? He doesn't just know it. He doesn't just know it. You know that when uh, I was there for the birth of my three children, and I know that that was a stressful time for their mother, right? But I can't feel what she felt. I can't really sympathize. I did the best I could, right? But I can't really sympathize all the way with her on that. But Jesus can. Jesus can, he feels our infirmities. He knows human limitation by experience. Jesus has been tired. Jesus has been hungry. He has felt pain. He knows disappointment. He has cried tears of sorrow. He has felt grief. Whatever you feel, Jesus has felt it. Jesus was touched by the power of of weakness and limitation. He was touched by the power of temptation. Now at this point, it's easy to say, well yeah, Jesus was God and He could never have sinned. And that is true. He's God and He could never have sinned. But does that mean that we discount the fact that He was tempted? On the contrary, Jesus being man experienced temptation. And you might be tempted to think that, that, that uh, it, it's uh, you know out of our league after all, how much temptation could Jesus actually feel, right? But the truth is, Jesus experienced temptation 
to a much higher degree than we have ever experienced it. You see, when we experience temptation, we oftentimes cave in. And the temptation leaves, or it, or it abates for the time being. We find an escape either by capitulating through actions or by detouring its effects through sins of the mind. And the temptation is gone. But Christ experienced every temptation without ever giving in, without ever detouring it, without ever capitulating to it. That means that he was tempted to the full measure, far past the point where we would give up and give in. He experienced every temptation to the maximum. And he experienced it as a man, as a human being. Remember that he knows everything we know and a great deal that we do not know about temptation and testing and pain as a man. And you think about this. We live in a messed up world. We see things going on. We see injustice. We, we see unrighteousness and it vexes us. And sometimes we're, we're tempted to mutter something under our breath or go on Facebook and rant about it, right? Because we're so grieved. But we're not even, we're not even holy compared to Jesus. And here he entered the pagan Roman world and he knew about everything. And every, even the little sins that wouldn't bother us bothered him. He felt all of that for 33 and a half years. And when you approach the throne of grace, you are met by this Jesus who gets you. He understands you. He knows your every feeling by experience. On that basis, Jesus gives you mercy exactly when you need it. You say, oh, he'll never forgive me. Yeah, he will. Oh, he'll never understand. He's God. I mean, he's just going to beat me over the head. No. He will separate your sins from you as far as the east is from the west. He offers understanding, pity, compassion for your need. When? When you come to him in prayer. So what does that mean? It means you're never alone. You're never misunderstood. Although the whole world may misunderstand you. Maybe no person will actually listen to you and hear you out. But Jesus will. And he knows. You can bring anything to him in any trial. And he will listen and understand and have compassion. Mercy is the great help in our time of need. Prayer avails us to that help. Let me give you the other way that we're helped in prayer at the throne of grace. In prayer, Christ gives you not only the help of mercy, but he gives you the help of grace. He gives you the help of grace. Mercy is the compassion of Jesus to us, but grace is much more. Grace is what enables us. Grace enables us to be saved, for by grace are you saved through faith. And grace enables us to pass through trials and to come out on the other side of the storm still clinging tightly to our profession of faith in Christ. It is grace that enables us to glorify God in trials. And we encounter that grace in prayer. In the year 1415, the Bohemian reformer John Hus was condemned to burn at the stake sitting in his prison cell the night before he would go to the stake, he decided to test his endurance with a match. So he lit the match and he, he put his hand into the flame of that match and immediately recoiled in pain. Huss is quoted to have said, if I can't withstand the fire of a candle, how the stake? But the next day, John Huss not only bore the flames, he died singing. You know what that is? Grace. Everybody has to go through the flames. The question is, are you going to be singing or screaming? You're going to glorify God or just be another pitiful person burned up? God's grace was sufficient and he went through the flames in a manner that glorified God. Verse 16, let us therefore come boldly under the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help 
in time of need. Our text earlier identified Jesus as Jesus, the Son of God. As Jesus, His humanity sympathizes with us and offers us mercy, compassion, and understanding. That's His humanity, but His divinity. Jesus, the Son of God. His deity strengthens us with grace and enables us to be faithful to Him during any trial or any temptation. We are commanded then to cling to Christ because there are times we're, we're tempted to loosen our, loosen our grip. And we do that through prayer. For it is in prayer that we find mercy and grace to help in the crucial moment, in the time of need. So build a habit of prayer before you enter that hour. Before the moment is upon you, what, what do you do for a habit of prayer God's people have a priest we don't have to go to some box and go through some ritual and offer some sacrifice in order to make an approach to God every moment of every day you can go to him in prayer why because Jesus our high priest is on the throne sitting at the right hand of the father that is the throne of grace to us have you built a habit of prayer now before the hour of temptation? Every day we ought to have, you ought to schedule a time and then you ought to be a habit even when you're not on the schedule to be prompted to pray. Also this, don't you dare trust yourself in the time of need. That's the opposite of prayer. That's kind of the American attitude. Pull myself up by the bootstraps. I'm going to gut it out and make it through, right? Power through it. No, rather depend fully upon God's grace and mercy to help in time of need. And then pray specifically for God's mercy and grace. What trial is it that's going on in your life? Pray specifically for God's grace. To bring you through, not just so you'll survive and still be alive on this earth, but that so you'll pass through the trial, pass through the flames with a song on your lips and glory going to God. That's why you're in the trial. That is, that is why God allows us to be tested. So that we'll come to Him, boldly approaching the throne of grace, finding God's help in time of our greatest need. Let's stand together.